Hey, thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk. It is time for our weekly Bible study. And today we're going to be talking about those times when you need to wait on God. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk. And then I publish two videos a week. I publish a replay of those Bible study videos as well as a video about books. So if you are interested in any of those things, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates about new videos. I also forgot to mention that I have been starting to do live streams on Sunday afternoons just with little updates on um, our adventures in uh, Pakistan with my Afghan Christian friends. It's Project Kabul Hope. Um, and uh, so I forgot to mention that, but I try to put most of the updates there. So I'm not talking about it in everything else, just in case you're not interested in that part of it. But this lesson is part of our Bible study series on straight pathways. It's going to be um, in a book uh, published later this year. So if you're interested in that, go to my website at racetowalk.org and sign up for the newsletter and you will get updates. I do not spam, I promise. I probably don't send as many emails as I should. But before we get started, let's just start this time with a prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this time and for this day. We thank you that you are our teacher and our guide. And I rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. Give us eyes to see you clearly. Give us ears to hear your voice. And give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. Okay, so we have had a couple lessons in this series so far. And um, this is really an exploration of how you can know God's plan for your life and how you can know that you're walking in his will. And in the first lesson we talked about, sometimes we can be in the middle of difficult situations and sometimes we get ourselves in these difficult situations, but sometimes we can um, be doing what, what we think that God wants us to do and or what we've been confident that God wants us to do. And we find ourselves in the middle of a mess. And we had a lesson about how do we, how do we know we're, we're in his well? And if we're going through some trials, does that mean that we're not? And we talked about sometimes the process, that process, that going through the trials process is actually part of God's plan, how he has to develop qualities in us that um, brings us to a point where we can um, carry and be prepared and ready for the thing that he has for us. We also talked about how important it is not to get hung up on expectations of what you think God has for you, um, what you think his plan is going to look like. Sometimes um, he can we know God wants us to do a particular thing or we know the end place where we're supposed to go. And then rather than trusting in him, we try to bring it about on our own. And so when God has given you a promise for your destiny or um, direction for your life, it's really important to trust him all along the way, not just say, okay, this is the end and I'm going to go, go my own way. We have to follow him along in each step. And so sometimes it's hard to be patient while we're going through that process, the difficult process, and also to continue to follow God in his steps. And we, we see where we, we want to go and we can say, God wants me to go in this direction, but it's taking too long and we try to jump start it. And so sometimes the danger is when we're in the middle of that pause. So the pause, what we see is a delay or a circumvention. Sometimes that is also part of the process. And when you read through the heroes of faith, there are very few people. I mean, very, very few people that didn't get tripped up in this particular area. You got, they, they believe God for the promise. And part of what the problem was is that they did believe it so strongly that they just went for it and they caused some problems for themselves. So even the most faithful, like Abraham and David, uh, they got off track once in a while. 
uh, and tried to do things in their own way. They had stumbles along their journey. For some, like Joshua, that precipitous action without checking in God, in with God at each step resulted in consequences that could be corrected. So Joshua, you know, when he lost the battle of Ai, he went to God and said, okay, what's the deal? And God told him. And so they addressed the issue and went forward. And for Moses, that stepping out of the plan caused a loss of the promised blessing. And Moses came right to the edge of the promised land, but missed out on actually going in because he was supposed to bring water from the rock, right? And he did what he had done before. He hit the rock instead of speaking to it. And because he did that, he lost the lesson. That may seem a little, you know, odd to us. He kind of did what God told him to do, but it wasn't the way he told him to do it. And I think that's an example to us that we have to make sure that we are always, you know, step by step with him. So when we imagine ourselves in the biblical account, it, you know, it's sobering to realize just how seriously God is about his people following his guidance rather than doing whatever seems best to them. And so we set out along the path that God has put in front of us. We have to learn not only to follow his direction, but also his rhythm. And sometimes there's a pause. There's times when we're, we're actually supposed to go and do, right? But then there's also times when we're to wait and we have, we let God work out those situations. So Psalm 62 is actually a prayer for those times. And more than that, it's a prayer for those times when everything seems to be against us and there is no justice to be found. My soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. So the psalmist begins a prayer by saying, my soul waits in silence. And when we are in a waiting period, it's usually because we have to. I, I don't know anybody. I, I don't know anybody that would wait out of choice, right? Why would you want to wait for something? And if we had our way, we would just go do and be done. Like, we had complete control over it, that's what we would do. But waiting is a big part of life, actually, and it's something we all have to do at one time or the other. We have to wait on other people. We have to wait for events and for situations to work out and process. You know, and when I became a parent, like a big part of my life became waiting. You know, you have to wait at doctor's offices, wait at school pickup lines, wait, you know, to go pick them up for practices and when they're with their friends. There's a lot of waiting, a lot. You know, I think if you've never been in a situation where you do actually have to wait for other people and it's just not all about you, you're probably going to be a pretty unpleasant and self-centered person. We all need to learn how to wait for other people, I think. But what we do with that time while we're waiting plays a big role in uh, shaping not only our own character, but how we interact with others and with God. So we can wait out of necessity, but it doesn't mean, always mean that we wait well. And sometimes, you know, we can be, begrudge that wait or become resentful and hold the person that we're waiting for hostage to that resentment. You know, abuse comes in a lot of different forms and you can actually be abusive in how you handle your, your waiting. Like if you, um, go in our, interacting with somebody's life, being enough a part of their life that you are waiting for them in whatever it is that they're doing, but then you aren't happy about it and you are like holding that over their head and poisoning whatever joy they would have had in that particular situation or in that interaction. Um, not only are you ruining the chance for the fellowship and the connection that you could have with that person, you know, but it's, it, that is actually abuse. That's abusive. It's emotional abuse. And sometimes we don't think about that, but it is. We think that if we're not like yelling or, um, being physically abusive, that's not abuse, but it is. It's emotional manipulation. It's abusive. It's actually, um, I think at least if some, if you, if a person is being hit, they know that they're being abused and it's wrong. But when you hold somebody, um, 
you know, the emotions hostage with, you know, like every interaction, like I'm doing this thing for you, but do you not be grateful? And this is my time and I could be doing all these other things, you know, then they are not as likely to recognize that that actually is abuse. And you personally aren't going to be as likely to recognize that that's abuse. And so anyway, I think that's one way that, um, we can really, um, misuse that waiting period. And sometimes we wait and we learn to fill the time in waiting with doing. And so in that case, we're really not waiting at all. Um, but we're simply working under different circumstances. So while writing this chapter, I realized that this is what, this is what I've done my entire life. I mean, at least my adult life since I've had a smartphone, I do rather than wait. Like I can, I usually always have something that I'm doing or something that I'm working on. And so while I was sitting waiting for, you know, in one car ride, a car rider line after another with three girls, I was one point I had them in three different schools. I would be responding to emails. You know, I had a Blackberry. I could get a lot done. I uh, was making phone calls or texts or was doing something. And so with unlimited data on a smartphone, and like I said, especially a Blackberry, there were very few times when I wasn't able to actually be doing something. The only time I can remember that that wasn't true was a year that my old, when my oldest daughter went to high school, they had the earliest release time. And so I would pick her up and then we would go and wait for my next daughter to get out. And it was almost an hour that we would be sitting and waiting in between when high school got out and the element, the next one, and that was elementary school. And so she would get out first. I would pick her up and she'd sit in the car and we'd just sit there and wait, you know, for my, youngest daughter, we would just talk and, or she would, she would share with me. I, I don't know that I really talk so much, but she would just share with me about what happened in the day and what's going on with her friends and just thoughts about life in general, just general conversations. It was just her and I, it was just a time for us to be together. And it was this, this alone time. And it was really only during that year when, cause when my other daughter went to high school you know, then the dynamics different and it wasn't just my oldest daughter, daughter and I, other than that, I was, I would probably just be working on something and I wouldn't be like sitting or being still or even having that, that type of interaction with someone, someone else. But when David writes that his soul waits in silence, he's saying he's being still before God and he's really being in communion and fellowship with him. You know, like the way I was with my daughter when you know, my focus was just on her and her alone during that time. So he's waiting in silence and he's communing with his heavenly father and he's waiting, not worrying about doing or about the all the striving. He's waiting, not worrying about doing or all the problems in life. He's just being still. He's abiding, not striving. And this is what it means to wait in silence. It talks about, uh, the New Testament writers talk about that too, but they phrase it in just a little bit differently. So how many of us do that? I know that I really don't all that often. Um, I probably do it kind of rarely, especially recently when I have, there's so much stuff going on and it's really hard for me to slow down. I was telling a friend, I can't even really watch TV anymore because it's just, I can't it just goes too slow and I like my mind is just going and I have all these different things that I need to be thinking about or doing, or at least like making a list of things I need to be doing. But, um, sometimes even my devotions, you know, I have to really focus and, um, be, uh, purposeful about trying to set everything aside because it's really easy for me to focus on production and producing. It's like, how many chapters did I read? And, you know, how many minutes did I pray? And did I pray for the right number of people and for the, you know, the right verses for them and for how long? And, you know, plans for study are good, but um, they can also be a hindrance if they are focusing on completing the plan rather than connecting to the one who is the source of the plan. And so we have to practice learning 
how to be still and abiding in God. And it's not something that you can just read about and then just turn around and do. It's something that we actually have to practice and become. It's like, it's a being. So let's continue in Psalm 62, verse 3. How long will you assail a man that you may murder him, all of you, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence? They have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delight in falsehood, they bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. So here David is making his complaint to God about people who are plotting against him. And the important lesson here is to recognize that we don't have, we don't have to pretend that we're just all good, you know, that we're just so forgiving and magnanimous about, you know, this wrong other people are doing to us and, you know, having these pious prayers. You know, if we're upset about it, it's okay to tell God, this is what David's doing. He's upset. He is upset and he's telling God about it. Um, we are not telling God anything he doesn't know when we do that. He already knows. He already knows that what our feelings are really like. And he's just waiting for us to be honest with him. But the qualifier is that we have to be honest with God, right? These are things that we should be saying to him, not necessarily to other people. We, we pour out our hearts to him. What we say to others, we have to be guarded in. And since some of the, actually some of the most clear guidance I've ever gotten in my life has come from God in a, in a time kind of like this. So there was a situation where I felt like I was really wronged and I felt sandbagged and maligned. I, it was something that, you know, if I told somebody else about it, they may not think it was, um, that big of a deal, but it really upset me. And so, you know, I was just talking to God about it and just telling him, I'm just like really, you know, I was really upset and, um, this is in my prayer time. So God will speak to me in uh, different ways. So, um, one of those ways is, um, sometimes I'll get like mental pictures. It's just like images in my mind. You know, it's not like a, I have had like external visions before, but it's usually, it's like, he'll just, I'll get just this image in my mind. As I was praying about this, I was just, you know, talking to God about the situation. I saw this mental, just this mental image of this picture of this grid of blue circles. That's all they were. Like it was started out like light blue circles and then went down to darker blue circles. And, um, I was like, Oh, okay. You know, that's cool. I mean, I didn't know what it meant. And that's the other thing too. This is kind of like at a point where I was just kind of getting used to having things like this. And I really, I mean, she just asked God what it is. He probably would have told me if I'd asked him, but I was like, Oh, wow, cool. I wonder what that is. And I didn't ask. So anyway, a couple days later at this time, I was like drawing pictures of the things that he was like showing me. So a couple days later, I, I was drawing it out. And when I was, when I was drawing what I had seen and my drawing skills aren't that great. And so, you know, it's probably the reason why he gave me something so simple to draw because that was something that I could manage. But as I was drawing this, I saw, saw it again. And it was, um, I just thought of this now as I'm saying this, it was this time it was like a movie, you know, I could just see this. It was like one of those, um, puzzle slide puzzles, you know, that where there's a picture and then you slide the tiles into place, but these were the circles. So what I was seeing, it was just like this really, really tiny part of this huge, big picture. And this little tiny part that I was seeing, each of the circles represented, uh, people. Like I could just tell, I knew like certain circles were these people and some of them were locked into place, you know, like together, like this is where they were going to be. This, this position was set, but then these other circles were being moved still. And, um, you know, it was like, God was saying to me, you're not in your spot yet. You have to be ready to be moved. What I just realized as I was just telling you this, that I can't remember what chapter it's in. It's a chapter with David's giving the, I want to say it's, Genesis 38, that may not be, may not be right, but 
anyway, it's in Genesis when Joseph is giving the interpretation to Pharaoh about his dreams. And he says, when you have two similar dreams, it means that God has decreed a thing and it will come to pass quickly. That should have been a heads up to me that like this wasn't an in the future, long in the future thing that it sh- was going to be happening like right away. Because it did actually, it was, I was thinking, oh, okay, cool. But I was thinking at some point, that's a whole other story. So back to the story, um, you know, I had an answer, but God didn't gossip with me about the people I was upset with. You know, he gave me a word, you know, this is a word to wait and to be ready, to be ready to move. Right. I, but I have to be honest, I still wanted the situation I was upset about to be resolved and fixed and acknowledged. <laughs> it wasn't, it was not. <laughs> so, you know, this is the thing. We are all free will human beings and God doesn't override anyone's free will. You know, even when we ask him to, you know, for other people, we don't want him to really do it to us. Right. But we want him to do it to other people. He doesn't do that. There are times, there are times that we're just going to have to trust him and wait in silence and wait in peace if he will bring justice and a good end. So verse five, my soul wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. He is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So in verse 1, David begins with, My soul waits. And it's like as is he's as in he is waiting in that present moment. That is his position at that moment. But then in verse five, he is telling himself, wait in silence for God only. So it's a reminder to stay in that position of waiting, of trusting in God. Because even if you start well, it's very hard to stay there. And I have to say that in that particular situation where I start, you know what, so there were parts where I felt like, okay, I'm waiting well, but then other parts where I wasn't, it's really easy to get out of it. So we may not like how God is working out the situation or the timing of it. But, um, if we come out of that silence and take matters into our own hands, we shouldn't do that, but it is easy to do. But the answer is to continue to abide in him. So verse nine, men of low degree are only vanity and men of rank are a lie. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than breath. Do not trust in impression and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. So the one thing you can count on about people is that at some point, everyone's going to disappoint you. God is the only one who is perfectly uh, faithful and perfectly just. And so we have to trust God, wait patiently and to do right. This is a message. Don't be deceived into thinking that certain people can bring about the end that you want. Don't think that you can do it yourself by oppressing or exploiting people and don't put your trust in wealth. Verse 11. Once God has spoken twice, I have heard this that power belongs to God. And loving kindness is yours, O Lord, for you recompense a man according to his work. David ends with an acknowledgement that not only does God alone have power over all, but that he has compassion on us. The word translated as loving kindness in the NSAB, um, the NIV translates it as everlasting love and the net as loyal love. The translation in my interlinear Bible app from Hegos Tap, I mentioned this in a couple. Uh, actually, I have a video, uh, fa- my five favorite uh, Bible study apps, and that's, I talk about this interlinear app in that. It translates that as mercy. So the Hebrew word is hesed, which I'm probably not saying that right. It has this k- sound in the beginning. Um, my um, Afghan <laughs> uh, kids that are, um, we're doing reading. They've helped me with some of the, um, the, uh, letter, Persian letters. And it has a similar sound to it too. And I don't really say that very well either. 
So anyway, it's um, from the Strong's number is Strong's 2617, and it means kindness by implication towards God, piety rarely by opposition, reproof, or subjectively, beauty, favor, good deed, good deeds, um, kindly, kindness, merciful, mercy, pity, reproach, a wicked thing. And so this verse reminds me of Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 4, where Paul writes that it is the kindness of God towards us that leads us to repentance. This is in that translation. Or do you disregard the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God kind, God's kindness leads you to repentance? So in the last part of verse 12, David writes that God recompense a man according to his work. Other translations render this word as reward or repay. Um, this is another word like the Hebrew word mishpat, which means can mean either justice or judgment, depending on the context. So, you know, it can be a positive or a negative for us because, you know, God is, he's perfectly good and he is perfectly right. And we choose how we experience that perfect truth. Will we experience um, justice and vindication or a negative justice? Will we receive a reward or be repaid, paid for wrong actions? So what David writes about in Psalm 62 is the same thing. Jesus is speaking of in John 15. So these are the words of Jesus in John 15, um, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, because apart from me you can accomplish nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a branch and dries up, and such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and are burned up. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. So abiding in him is the same as waiting in silence. We, it's similar. I guess it's not exactly the same, but it, it's that same sense of we just have to wait in God, right? We are trusting in God, waiting on him and following his lead. And we have to learn how to go with his flow. So if we don't have moments when we learn how to wait in silence, we are not going to be able to walk in the abiding, right? We have to walk in his lead. And so this is something that's really difficult for me and um, to remember. It's like, I, I just, I hate to wait and uh, I like to do things and get things done. And I like to like make lists and uh, like to check off boxes. And I used to think that this was just part of my personality. And then I just recently realized that now actually, I mean, I may have to, may have always had tendencies towards this anyway, but I also went to a private Christian school where we had goal charts like in front of us that we checked off daily. And so even now, if I don't have like a list or a spreadsheet, preferably color coded, <laughs> I can like organize what I need to do. Um, it kind of starts stressing me out a little bit. So, you know, I'm really good at doing and completing things, but, um, I realize I need to learn how to just be and not feel guilty about it. Cause that's, that's the other thing too. Even like if I am trying to just sit and be still, then I feel a little guilty about like not using that time to do something. So the whole mindset of like, do it and be done may work on projects, but that's, I just realized this too. That's not life with life. If you're done, it means you're dead. And so, um, if we want to have a long life and one that's walking in the abundance of God, we need to learn how to like walk in that flow. And sometimes that means waiting. So that is the lesson for today. The Psalm 62 was actually God's word for me this week. And I was like, <laughs> do you know how much stuff I have to do? Because it's like, I just have no idea. It, it, this is really difficult for me. Like just, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can't even explain to you like just how much this lesson, like I am working through right now. That's the thing, right? I need to let God teach me this rather than thinking that I have to work through it. But it's a process. 
And luckily, God's very patient with us. And um, so you can be praying for me about that. <laughs> this is my lesson. I don't know how long it's going to take me to learn this lesson. But uh, anyway, yeah, we need to learn how to wait in silence and abide in God. So anyway, again, um, if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. If you would like to support this ministry, you can go to racewalk.org forward slash give. Also sign up for my newsletter there and be sure to check back. So let's just end this time with a prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you are so good to us. And Father, help us to learn how to trust you and give us a grace to recognize when we're striving rather than abiding in you and waiting patiently in you. We thank you, Father, that through your son we can have your peace. And we thank you for all of these things. We pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, thanks for joining me, and I will see you next time.